friends, Elisa Childers here, and today we're going to talk about the Old Testament, rape, genocide. Does the Bible condone these things? Is the God that we find in the Old Testament nothing more than a capricious bully, as atheists like Richard Dawkins would have us believe? That's what we're going to talk about on today's podcast. Well, I'm so thrilled to get to talk with today's guest, Dr. Paul Copan. Paul is a theologian and analytic philosopher who has really just been such an influential voice in my life, my own thinking, particularly his book, Is God a Moral Monster? It's one of those books that I just keep going back to and using as a reference. Uh, He's written or edited over 25 books, including a new one coming out in October called Origins, The Ancient Impact and Modern Implications of Genesis 1 through 11, which is actually one of my favorite sections of scripture. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, He was the president of EPS, which is the Evangelical Philosophical Society for six years, and he's a professor at the Palm Beach Atlantic University. So Paul, it's so great to get to talk with you today. Thank you, Elisa. Great to be with you. Well, one of the topics that you speak and write a lot about is the violence in the Old Testament or how some people can read the Old Testament and then read the New Testament. And it can seem like there are two different gods going on there, that you've got the God of the Old Testament that is angry and uh, vindictive, and then you've got the the kind of meek and mild Jesus of the New Testament. And so you write a lot about these topics, but I'm just before we get into some of them, I'm curious what first got you interested in that realm of study? Well, I grew up, you know, being exposed to these sorts of texts, um, but it was, and I've always had an interest in these uh, Old Testament texts and wrestling with some of the difficulties of those passages. I did back in, you know, just shortly after September 11th, uh, it started to come across a lot of these new atheists, you know, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and so forth. And, and many of them were, uh, were trashing the God of the Old Testament. And uh, many people are mm-hmm. familiar with one of Richard Dawkins noted lengthy quotations describing the God of the Old, the Old Testament as being the most unpleasant character in all of fiction, etc. And yes. so as I started reading them, I, I just saw how they were misrepresenting and misunderstanding what was going on in the Old Testament. Now, again, not that there aren't difficult passages, uh, but I just found that it was a lot of rhetoric and a lot of uh, uh, premature dismissal without actually taking seriously what was going on in the Old Testament text. So that was that led to the writing of an article, and then that unfolded uh, into the writing of a full-length book uh, on the Old Testament difficulties uh, called "Is God a Moral Monster?" And then that grew into uh, co-authoring a, a book with Matthew Flanagan uh, from New Zealand, a theologian there, and uh, we did a book called "Did God Really Command Genocide?" which focuses on the very issue of the violence. In the Old Testament, so that's the uh, that's the a little bit of the unfolding of how all of these things uh, came about. I hadn't ever really thought about it, to be honest. All my life, I've loved the Bible, I've read the Bible, but as a little girl, I would read stories like Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho. We'd sing the song in church, you know, probably even acted it out, walking around the classroom seven times, and then you cheer when the walls come down and. You know, I would read stories of David in battle and just be excited when he won. And and I never really thought of anything, uh, you know, in a negative sense until I was an adult. And I, I began to think more deeply about some of these stories. And so I began to discuss them with some uh, friends who were also Christians and particularly in a class that I was in at a church that would later become a very liberal and progressive church. And so some of my friends, as they were talking about some of these stories began to adopt the idea that whenever you read something in the Old Testament that seems wrong or seems uh, immoral to you, that must be something that God never really commanded. So when God commands the Israelites to go in and, and, you know, wipe out the Canaanites, that was just their idea of what they thought God wanted, but that wasn't really God. And so I was particularly interested in a discussion that you had recently with Greg Boyd on the Unbelievable podcast with Justin Brierley, where Boyd has written a book 
uh, about a new way to read the Old Testament, kind of in this way through a cruciform lens is what he calls it. And it's a way that's very different than Christians have historically understood it. And you were uh, critical of his views, and you wrote a great article that uh, appeared on the Gospel Coalition about this. So talk a little bit about what his main thesis is in his book and the, the problems that you have with it. Well, I think that <clears throat> Greg, you know, who's a friend, uh, you know, he has written a book that I think does create uh, a chasm between the the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. Um, he takes his starting point as, you know, he talks about cruciformity, uh, when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, that this, uh, rather than retaliating, rather than uh, acting violently, Jesus gave himself up voluntarily uh, to death and even offering forgiveness uh, and praying for forgiveness for those who had put him to death, etc. So that should be our model. And that is really, Greg Boyd says, that reflects the heart of God and that that is how we ought to look at the character of God. Uh, of you know the disciple and how we ought to live uh, to shun violence to uh, to and thus to rework our understanding of what is going on in the Old Testament that if the heart of God is nonviolent uh, pacifistic uh, if you will uh, then we need to rework what is going on in the Old Testament so Greg's approach is that we distinguish he's following um, Eric. Uh, cybered on the matter, uh, an Old Testament scholar who distinguishes between the actual God and the textual God. So if the if the uh, if the, we're not talking about um, kindness and uh, and so forth and and an aversion of uh, towards violence, then uh, then that's got to be the ancient authority, the ancient writer basically superimposing his own worldview that is violent, that is. That is uh, that is um, you know uh, less than ideal. Uh, that is perhaps um, you know even opposed to the purposes of God. So basically, it's a superimposition of the ancient worldview upon what God said, so that God's message is distorted. So it's not the actual God, but the textual God, uh, the God of the ancient writers or authorities' worldview, which is violence prone, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so Greg Boyd is uh, making that distinction, and uh, and anything that smacks of violence, that smacks of um, you know, harshness, etc., that cannot be the the reflecting the, the mindset of the true God. God could not have commanded those sorts of things. Um, I do think that Greg goes through a number of. No, he, I think what what is attractive about what Greg is doing is, of course, he's trying to bring consistency here. Uh, but what I think he does is he lands on certain lines of thinking, and we can agree up to a point, but he wants to take them all the way. And I think the New Testament actually itself keeps us in check from mm. doing that. So, for example, um, Greg Boyd wants to uh, portray Jesus in the temple when he's driving out the money changers as basically not hurting anybody or any animals. So no animals were hurt <laughs> in the production of this uh, this story. And, uh, well, that's interesting, but Jesus is still engaging in what we would call you know, forceful, uh, the use of coercive force. Uh, that doesn't sound like Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So I think what we have to do is say, well, this is a different portrayal than what Greg is giving us as what, you know, the only thing that we really need to look at is the cruciform uh, picture. No, you see more about what's going on with the life of Jesus, uh, like the driving out of the money changers, and you need to keep reading the, the scriptures, and you get to Revelation chapter 2, where Jesus is speaking about bringing judgment upon certain churches, and he mentions one false teacher, Jezebel, a prophetess, a false prophetess, and Jesus says that he's going to cast her on a bed of sickness, and he is going to strike dead her followers. Mm -hmm. Well, again, that does not sound like the cruciform Jesus that Greg Boyd is wanting to basically, you know, keep preserve in this very limited freeze frame view. And uh, you know, and again, Greg Boyd is writing off, I think, a lot of you know the language of the New Testament. Greg says, "No, we need to pray for our enemies. We shouldn't um, rejoice when they uh, when they suffer, when they're judged, or something like that." 
Well, I mean, you look at the book of Revelation, and there is rejoicing that God has brought justice, that he has been, uh, that he has avenged himself, that he has brought an end to sin and wickedness and so forth, and she has received double for all her sins, Babylon. You know, and so rejoice, you know, the one, you know, those who are martyrs and, and prophets and so forth, rejoice over her, Revelation 19 says, um, because she has received double uh, for what she has done. So, so there is that picture of, you know, Greg Boyd doesn't believe that God can bring, uh, you know, that God brings retributive justice. It always has to be redemptive. It always has to be restorative. Well, that's not the picture that we always see in the scriptures. Yes, there is some restorative uh, justice and so forth, and even church discipline should be restorative, uh, you know, to, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, chapter 5, to, to restore that person who has been living in an adulterous relationship. But, but again, you still do see the the retributive uh, at work as well, and I think that Greg, uh, you know, that there are so many things that we see going on in the New Testament that are actually showing continuity, and Greg downplays mm -hmm. a number of those things, and I talk about uh, some of those things in my article. I could say a lot more uh, about that, but uh, but those are a few things that are going on, and and I, I guess when it comes to the issue of the question of the Canaanites, we we don't see anything negative about the warfare exploits of, say, Joshua, uh, you know, Paul, uh, as well as Stephen in the book of Acts, Acts 7, Acts 13, uh, talk about this, you know, that God, you know, dis you know that God destroyed the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the people of the land, that they were driven out and so forth. And, and in Hebrews chapter 11, the people of God are celebrated for their courage, for their uh, bravery, for their faith, uh, that they conquered kingdoms and so forth, and that Rahab, for example, is not punished with those who are disobedient. So it looks like there is a, a picture of judgment here, that, that there is no distancing uh, of the author uh, from, you know, he's not saying, oh, but God didn't do this, it was just Joshua who was doing this. No, there's a celebration of faith. Now, Greg Boyd would reinterpret that, and I think he's really going on, he's stretching things considerably uh, beyond what the author is, uh, uh, you know, is intending uh, to say, yeah, they were really doing their best, even though they were doing what we would consider demonic today. Uh, that doesn't look at all like uh, what the author of Hebrews is uh, is uh, is saying. So, so again, I you know, and, and, and he chastises even Paul for uh, for telling the Thessalonians that they are going to be uh, vindicated, that God is going to uh, you know you know bring retribution to those who are persecuting the Thessalonians, and and he says that this is because of Paul's or the Thessalonians' blood blood bloodlust. Uh, that uh, that he's saying these things. Well, no, the same sort of language is used by, you know, you know, in the book of Revelation. Even the martyrs are using this language of retribution, of bringing justice. How long, O oh Lord, until you bring, you know, until until you avenge our blood, etc. So these are the redeemed martyrs in Revelation chapter six. So again, it, the more you read, you might, you start to see some of these cracks and fissures, and it it just doesn't hold up. Even though there's some themes that we can embrace, you know, God's withdrawing. Uh, his presence, and therefore other uh, forces can can kind of fill in the vacuum, et cetera. True, that's that's true up to a point, uh, but that's not the total picture. And so I think that that's part of Greg's appeal. He he hits on some of these particular lines of reasoning, but he wants to take them the whole way, whereas the scriptures actually don't uh, don't uh, allow us to go that far. And uh, and so I, I'd emphasize that as Paul does in uh, in Re in Romans eleven twenty two, he says, "Behold the kindness." and severity of God. And I think that Greg really wants to downplay the severity part, and uh, he is uh, wanting to look solely at the kindness part. And we see that in the, in the New Testament that there is uh, just punishment, that even the author of Hebrews talks about punishments uh, in the Old Testament that were seen as just. And, uh, and Jesus himself talked about capital punishment as being part of the commandment of God. Matthew chapter 15, Greg Boyd says that's not really what it says. Um, he play, try, kind of dances around that sort of a thing. But no, Jesus says that this is the commandment of God, um, that the one, who, uh, the one who maligns or curses his father and mother shall be put to death. Again, uh, Greg, I think, just has to do a lot of dancing around a number of texts in order to try to hold his position consistently. And I just don't, don't think it works at all. 
Well, and I'll post a link uh, to the conversation you had with him on that podcast because it was really fascinating. And I'm glad you mentioned the appeal of it because uh, the appeal of it is understandable. We read these these verses that are hard to make sense of, especially as modern people when we're uh, reading about uh, God commanding the Israelites to go in and and wipe out every living thing. And, and you mentioned Richard Dawkins, of course, and his famous quote. I actually have it written down here to read for anyone who hasn't heard it. This is what Richard Dawkins said about God in the Bible. He said, uh, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, in infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevol- malevolent bully. I almost made it through without <laughs> stumbling. <laughs> I, I've been practicing. I, I, I don't think I've ever gotten through it once. But, uh, but, but the appeal of trying to find a way to resolve these issues is uh, understandable and obvious. And I think that you have done such a great job of really digging into the text and explaining what's really going on. And one of the things that is so difficult for so many Christians is the challenge of the Canaanite conquest. And I've heard it called genocide. You know, this is what Dawkins is referring to when he calls God genocidal, is that the Israelites were commanded to go in and wipe out the Canaanites. So let me just ask you, uh, did God commit genocide when uh, he commanded this, this conquest as atheists and others assert? Yeah. Well, the, the, the quick answer is no, um, that what we, the language we see is that of exaggeration and hyperbole. Um, we also need to remember, too, that, uh, one, keep this in, keep the broader spiritual issue in mind. Uh, we're really dealing with uh, spiritual warfare here. Uh, we're dealing with a, uh, a group of people uh, God has waited over 500 years. I mean, he speaks to Abraham and says that he's going to wait until the sins of the Amorites are completed uh, or filled up. So it's, you know, which includes 430 years in uh, you know, of Israel and Egypt, including slavery in Egypt. And so, uh, so we have a one a serious spiritual decline. Uh, we also, because the Canaanites were kind of friendly with uh, Abraham and the other patriarchs, um, so they hadn't reached rock bottom yet. I'm not saying that the Canaanites were the worst specimens of humanity out there, but uh, but they certainly had were engaging in the sorts of things that would be considered criminal acts in any civilized society. You, know, you think of incest, you think of bestiality, you think of ritual prostitution, you think of infant sacrifice. Uh, these are not just, it's not as though the, the Canaanites are just wearing tattoos and the Israelites aren't. Uh, you know, that this is something much more serious. And I think given the seriousness of the uh, danger, the spiritual danger that this would put not only Israel in, but by extension, the uh, jeopardize the very redemption of God in the world, if Israel capitulates, uh, we need to see this in a broader context, that the uh, that targeting the Canaanites uh, is not motivated by any sort of ethnic uh, uh, motive, you know, of uh, right. getting the outs- getting rid of the outsiders or the people who are different from the Israelites. Um, they were actually from the same stock. But on the other hand, what you see going on is that Israel's mission is going to be compromised. God's redemption is going to be compromised uh, and may not come off unless there is a severe dealing with those who are engaging in these criminal activities that have a corrosive effect on those around them. In fact, the Israelites are routinely getting sucked into that. So it's, it's it, you know, it, it, the admonition is very strong for a, for a reason. Uh, so there's a kind of spiritual warfare going on here. And it is, you know, these it, there, it's a cosmic battle that is taking place. It's not just one nation kind of invading another. Uh, no, there is something, you know, there's a much bigger picture here that we ought to take into consideration. And so God, in his commanding these things, is, you know, has morally just justifiable reasons for doing so. It is limited. It is uh, limited in geography. It is limited to a certain period of time. It's not as though this is normative for the people of God. This is seen as highly exceptional. 
uh, for the Israelites to engage in. Um, but beyond this, uh, we see, first of all, the primary command is to drive out the Canaanites. Uh, if you're driving them out, you're not killing them. Uh, but you also see that even when the Israelites, when it, we read about the Israelites have, you know, they've utterly, they utterly destroyed them, they didn't leave any survivors and so forth. This is kind of stock language for, you know, that's exaggerated uh, in ancient Near Eastern war texts. You see this kind of language in, in Egypt, in Assyria, uh, in Moab and so forth. From the inscriptions, it looks like the other nation has been completely wiped out. Um, whereas it actually may not even be a decisive victory for those who are inscribing these in their annals. They're actually, you know, even at a stalemate, but yet they say we utterly destroyed them. We wiped them out. They were as dust and so forth. So, so you have that type of hyperbole or exaggeration that is just part of the ancient Near Eastern war text language. And so we will often see language both of utter destruction uh, and secondly, of many survivors. Uh, a lot of people want to focus on, look at all of those people who are utterly destroyed, uh, and, but they don't want to look at the list of the many survivors, sometimes in the same verse, uh, many people who have survived. And so, uh, so I want to say, if you want to say, if you want to treat the issue fairly, look at both columns, not just the column where they're utterly destroyed, there are no survivors, but look at all the places where they were actually you know, remaining there to this day. In fact, uh, the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem uh, were told, first of all, that their city was destroyed with fire and that they were destroyed, etc. And then we read later on in Judges, the same chapter, Judges chapter one, that they were not, the Benjamites were not able to drive them out, and they are there to this day. Mm. Uh, so, so you have those sorts of tensions, and if you, if you say, well, you know, if you want to be literalistic about it, you'll say, well, look, this is just a contradiction, but if you understand the ancient Near Eastern war text language, then you say, oh, there's no contradiction at all. This, uh, this, this perfectly fits what's going on. Uh, in a recent book by uh, John Walton, uh, he, uh, you know, it's on the Israelite conquest, he talks about the language of Utter, you know, utterly destroy, uh, he basically argues, and I think it makes sense, uh, it makes sense of what we see going on in the, in, the, in the text, if you look at all of the texts, rather than just singling out the utter, utterly dis destroy texts, um, where you have, it's like the Nazis, when they are engaging in warfare, um, you know, and then, then there is the, then the allies come in and they, they basically, um, defeat the, the, um, the Axis powers and Nazi Germany in particular. And, uh, John Walton writes that the same sort of thing is going on. The, the German nation remained pretty much intact, but the military, uh, personnel, the, you know, were, were, they were executed. You had the, the statues that are, that are torn down. The flags are, are destroyed. Uh, the Nazi ideology is vilified and uh, and new structures are put in place. And basically, he says that that's what it means to utterly destroy, you know, that word haram. Uh, it basically means to remove or to, uh, you know, to remove from use or to remove the identity of something. And so that's why a lot of these commands to destroy the altars and so forth, uh, or even the military leaders and kings, these are the marks of identity for them. Uh, and so when you are destroying them, when you are removing them, you are, you are removing their identity, that which gives them a sense of continuity, a sense of, uh, you, know, you know, this is where I fit in. And so, uh, and so John Walton says it's basically the same sort of thing. The German nation remained intact overall, unless they were fighting. But, uh, but basically, uh, you just have the Nazism weeded out, and, and that is destroyed, and that kind of that point of identity is removed. Uh, so he talks about in, in Leviticus 27, where you have that term, you know, haram, uh, used uh, where, where a, someone who is put up, you know, you have a field that is, uh, that is uh, that is to be haram. Well, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you burn the field or destroy it. It's actually a field that is now removed from ordinary use, and is going to be used for, say, the priest uh, or someone who is a per, you know, a servant who is you now who is you know again harem or haram. 
he is removed from ordinary use so that he can serve in the temple. He's not killed. He's not destroyed. Um, but he could you know, endanger his life or jeopardize his life if he leaves that vocation to which he has been committed um, as a servant within, say, the tabernacle or you know, the temple later precincts. So, so again, it's not a, as though it, it should be rendered even utter, utterly destroyed. Uh, but it has to do with that sense of removal from use. Anyway, I can go into a lot more detail on this, but, uh, but again, I would point people in the direction of that book. Well, I want to take a break from this conversation for just a moment to talk with you about one of my sponsors, Impact 360. Go to impact360.org and check out all of the amazing experiences they offer for young people every summer and throughout the year. You know, just having this conversation about difficult Old Testament passages makes me think about the challenges our kids are facing when they go off to college or even just open their computers or their iPhones. They're facing skeptical claims against Christianity at younger and younger ages, stuff that I never even heard of till I was an adult. And it fills me with a passion to help equip them, to help train them to face these intellectual challenges, but not just that, but spiritual challenges and emotional challenges. And that is what Impact 360 is all about. I'll be speaking at the Propel Experience next summer, and right now is the early bird pricing. So you get $100 off just because of the early bird, but if you go to impact360.org slash propel and use my name as a promo code, that's ALISA, all caps, A-L-I-S-A, you'll get an additional $50 off for a total of $150 off your tuition. It's a great time to register your high school student, and I'd love to meet them there next summer. All right, let's get back to our discussion. This may not be a good example, but you talked about the hyperbole and exaggeration in ancient war texts. But if we do that now, somebody would talk about their football team beating another football team and say, we utterly destroyed them. You know, I don't know if that relates at all, but hmm? that doesn't mean you're being contradictory necessarily. Like if somebody goes and says, oh, well, they're not utterly destroyed. Well, you meant it in a hyperbolic way uh, to exactly. make a point, but nobody would say you're being contradictory. Yeah, yeah, they had a, they had their ancient Near Eastern version of trash talk back then. <laughs> right, what they do today in sports. <laughs> right. So uh, you mentioned how God waited over four hundred years to let the sin of the Amalekites come mm -hmm. to full uh, fruition, and uh, which I just think shows God's patience and His mercy. He He's not as Richard Dawkins suggests. Uh, petty or uh, just flying into a rage the second something happens in a surrounding nation. And, and that's such an important point to, to, to bring out as well. If somebody hears everything that you've just said and they say, okay, you know, uh, maybe everything you're saying is true and it wasn't an utter destruction, uh, but what about the command that God gives to kill everything that breathes? It, isn't that a, a little harsh? You know, you get the picture of a woman with her children cowering under the Israelite sword, and that's that's hard to deal with. How how do we explain that? Yeah. Well, the you know the language that is being uh, used is basically very sweeping. It doesn't make any sort of discrimination. It doesn't discriminate here. Um, but typically what, what happens in these warfare scenes is that the women and the children are the first ones to leave. They're not even going to be on the scene. Uh, you do have this kind of sweeping language. But I, I would also point people to the fact that where you do have mention of people who have been utterly destroyed, as it were, to use that uh, rendering, uh, you keep reading those texts and you find out they actually weren't utterly destroyed. It has, it, you get the impression that it has more a, a sense of disabling, like Kenneth Kitchen, the Egyptologist, uh, who writes in his book on the reliability of the Old Testament, that when the Israelites are going into, say, you know, these, these, these cities that are, uh, you know, that are occupied by the Canaanites, typically they're citadel cities, and uh, sol soldiers are the ones who are the, the predominant uh, residents there. And these are disabling raids. The Israelites go in there. They kill the military leader. They disperse the citizens or, you know, those who are living there, typically the military folks. And they go back to their headquarters, uh, their base camp at Gilgal. So they're engaging in what we would call disabling raids rather than ravaging the, the landscape uh, like a bulldozer or something like that. Uh, it is much less uh, tidy than that, and it is something that takes place over a long period of time. It's 
a very gradual uh, sort of a thing. It's also mentioned that we, re we read about cities that are harem, uh, that are uh, under the ban, as it were. These are cities that, you know, like, for example, we read in, in um, Joshua about the northern cities that are, you know, again, under the ban or haram. Well, they are, you know, they're not all destroyed. I mean, there are just only three cities that are destroyed. And, you know, Hazor, um, you know, uh, Jericho and I of, of all of the cities. And, uh, and Hazor is the only one from the north that is destroyed, you know, or burned with fire. So what is going on here? Well, I think it means, you know, the, the language means more than just utterly devastate and, uh, and kill everyone there. There's a lot more flexibility. Now, of course, if God commanded something that may seem harsh to our ears, um, well, God being intrinsically good and, uh, and wise and all-knowing and so forth, if he truly did command that, then he would have justifiable reasons for doing so. But I think that we have good reasons from the text itself to question whether that sort of a thing is actually going on. Uh, and, uh, and I think that there is, uh, you, you see all sorts of nuance here. You have, uh, again, language that the, you know, they've been utterly destroyed, but then they show up, like even Saul, when he's t told to utterly destroy the Amalekites, the narrator tells us, that Saul utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But then David, later on in the book, is fighting against the Amalekites in the same breadth of terrain, like 120 miles, fighting against the Amalekites in that same territory. So something else is going on here, and I, I think we just need to be better attuned to the text so that we can pick up on these things. And uh, you know, and God himself says that he's going to bring judgment on Judah in Jeremiah 25, 9, where he says he's going to utterly destroy Judah and, and all of these cities through Babylon and leave them in everlasting desolation. Well, for one thing, that same language of the Canaanites, you know, Haram is used of the, uh, of the cities of Judah. Well, were they utterly destroyed? Well, no, and they were only devastated for 70 years, not for, you know, everlastingly. Uh, and, and what we, but what we do see is that Judah has been disabled. Judah has been disabled at the end of the book of Jeremiah, you know, in terms of its economic, religious, social, military, and so forth. Everything has been, you know, has been brought to a halt. It's been disabled. It uh, doesn't mean that the, the, the nation of Judah no longer existed or that they had all been wiped out. So, so I think as we keep on reading the text, we find out that there's a lot more texture, a lot more nuance that is going on here than I think a lot of people acknowledge. Another objection that I hear a lot that comes up, you know, I, I deal a lot in the world of progressive Christianity. That's kind of my main area of research. And I find that a lot of the objections they bring up are the same ones that atheists bring up. And so one of the objections I hear in that world a lot is that the Old Testament uh, condones rape. The verse they bring up to say this is, is from Exodus 22, which says, if a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. And so the claim is that not only does this reward a man for raping a woman by getting to marry her, but her fate is completely at the hands of the men in her life, the father and her rapist, and she has no rights and nothing to say about anything. So can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, well, for one thing, uh, you could imagine, you know, again, as I mentioned in my book, Is God a Moral Monster? This is not a rape scenario that a lot of that often comes to mind. Um, it is what, what would be called, there are different, different degrees here. And, and this one is specifically re, you know, referring to statutory rape, where you can have someone who is maybe a minor or someone who is. Uh, who who still may have affection for this person who was you know involved in 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 the sexual encounter but was not legal so to speak um, that it was an inappropriate act but it doesn't mean that there wasn't any sort of affection or attachment between them it was simply because you're taking advantage of a minor here so so you have that sort of a picture which is a different one from you know yet another uh, you know section here and also mentioned in Deuteronomy where there is a forced rape where say someone is raping someone and they're out in a, a field and no one can hear her when she screams that's a different sort of a scenario the language is different and so we need to see that there are distinctions that are made even within the text also when there has been something if, if the daughter 
is someone who actually likes this person who, yes, engaged in what's what we'd call statutory rape, but again, is not necessarily seen as something that is forceful and violent, uh, but could even be, it could be mutual. Uh, but again, it's, you know, you're dealing with someone who is, a, you know, a, a minor, then, then that would be a different sort of scenario. But there would still be the option, do you want to marry him or do you, you know, not want to? Uh, so there's still an option that is given here. A lot of people think that the, the, you know, the girl has no say. Also that the, a father who would no doubt be concerned about shame and reputation and so forth, you know, that there would be a, a great concern to, in a sense, defend the family honor and so would want to make sure that if any, if something is done that would be in violation of the the will of his daughter and so forth, that this would be a serious issue. Uh, so so I think that what we have going on here is something that is much more, you know, you, you think more in terms of, say, a shotgun wedding uh, mm-hmm. rather than something that is, you know, rape in our minds. So, so it, it's really that sort of a scenario. And, uh, and, and judges and fathers are ones who are going to be involved in this legal process. And it's not something that is going to be inimical or slanted against the, the girl. It is simply a situation in which the father indeed is the legal um, head, the representative for the family, uh, and therefore is making decisions. But it's not going to be overriding the well-being or even the will uh, of his own daughter. But he is the he was the legal point person for the family, and so it, it should be read in that kind of a context. And the other verse that gets brought up a lot it's Deuteronomy twenty one ten through fourteen, and this is what it says. When you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord, your God gives them into your hand and you take them captive and you see among the captives, a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife and you should bring her to your house and she shall have <clears throat> her head and pair her nails. And she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured and shall remain in your house and lament her father and mother a full month. And then after that, you may go into her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants, but you shall not sell her for money nor treat her as a slave since you've humiliated her. And so you can see why this would be troubling because it seems to be saying that you can take women as war booty, basically. And if you're not, you know, rape them. And if you're not happy with them, you can throw them back out on the street. And that's the interpretation that gets brought out a bit. But uh, I wonder if you might be able to shine some light on what was going on in that verse there. Right. Well, uh, keep in mind that women who were, who are left desolate after a war, you know, there's a question, well, what do you do with them? I, I think this should be right. seen as something that is one, a, a merciful act, Secondly, it is an act of separation from one's previous culture and now embracing a new culture, the, the, the land of you know, the, the nation of Israel in a covenant relationship with God. And so there is this time of lamenting the past, of saying goodbye to the past and embracing now a new reality, namely life within Israel. And what is interesting here is why doesn't, why doesn't the man just take the woman and rape her? Uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, look at how terrible this is. No, it's actually, uh, there is a, there is a, a modesty here. There is no, in a sense, a prerogative of the man to do what he wants of the woman. There is a regard for her well-being. There is a, uh, an allowing for her to mourn and grieve, hence the, the trimming of the nails and the shaving of the head, etc. Yeah, and there was to be no sexual intercourse before marriage. That was just the law of Israel. I mean, other nations around Israel, they they engaged in rape uh, very freely. But in Israel, you have, you know, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes so-and-so in a baby carriage. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, this is anchored in, uh, in Genesis 2, 23, 24. You know, for this cause, a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. That is the order. Uh, you even have legislation that that raises the question, you know, of a man who says, "I assume that my wife was a virgin when I married her." Well, that was the that was the assumption. You assumed that your wife was a virgin when you married her. That's just the assumption. That's the mindset of Israel to commit adultery, uh, to engage in impurity uh, with something that was outside of the uh, the commands of God. It was a violation of those things. You shall not commit adultery. And so that would be, you know, if you just raped a woman, that would be engaging in adultery or some some variation of that fornication. Right. 
So, so again, these are the types of things that are often overlooked. Some people say, well, you know, then the man can discard her. Well, no, he when he considers and maybe says, you know, maybe I was hasty. I thought I, w- I wanted to marry her. But maybe there are some things that you see and you say, well, uh, I don't think this would be a good fit. And so, but he is not to treat her with disdain. He is to treat her with dignity and so forth. You know, we, we even have people who have broken off their engagements just before marriage. Well, we'd say, well, that's a good thing to realize that before the time comes, rather than embarking on something that you re- later come to regret. So again, it's not as far-fetched as we might think, uh, even in the 21st century. And think as a woman, I've often thought about and you can tell me if I've got the scenario right or not, but I've often thought about as a woman, if I'm living in a culture that's readily engaging in infant sacrifice, in bestiology, temple prostitution, just a completely depraved uh, society, and the men get get uh, defeated in war, and then I'm thinking, what happens to me? You have this group of people coming in who live under a moral law that's given to them by a just God. And you compare that with all of the atrocities of my own culture, and it just brings in a different perspective. And isn't it true that these wives were actually given all of the rights and privileges of Jewish wives? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't as though you're treated as an inferior. You are treated as someone who is brought in as a as a as a partner in marriage uh, and the command of your offspring would be to honor your father and your mother uh, so so there is that that fundamental uh, equality that is there well this is great stuff and if anyone's listening you want to know more I just highly recommend uh, Paul's book is God a moral monster all the verses that you can find that you are struggling with I guarantee you they're in there and he talks about them and uh, gives you lots of context and what's going on. So definitely get that book, Is God a Moral Monster? And Paul, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lisa. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can sign up to receive my posts by email by going to alisachilders.com and clicking the subscribe button, or simply subscribe to the Alisa Childers podcast on iTunes.